Before we start in Luke, though, I want to, uh, this kind of came to mind is, you don't have to turn there, but 2 Timothy, since this is the Christmas season, uh, I think this might give us some wise advice, maybe, wisdom, about the upcoming next month or so. You know, we've heard these verses before. But when you look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting at verse 6, he says, Scripture says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. We have to ask ourselves, what's godliness? Godliness is becoming more Christ-like, putting other people first. It, it, it's godliness is becoming more like Jesus Christ. So if our goal in life, sanctification, now godliness with contentment is great gain. If we continue to be sanctified more in the image of Christ, that is what great gain is. That is where we receive our contentment. Because look at verse 7. He says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. Now when it says, For, that's the big word, for. For we brought nothing into this world. When we were born, you were born a little baby without any stuff. And you were valuable. <laughs> You were made in the image of God. That's before you start accumulating stuff. Because what happens? We start accumulating stuff. And then we, but we have to always remember how valuable we were before we owned anything. And then as we go through life, we start accumulating stuff. And it's really a temptation to start thinking that our value is related to the stuff we have. And it's not. Because what does scripture say next? And it is certain we can carry nothing out. We're not going to bring any of the stuff with us. As we were born into the world without any stuff, we're valuable, and we're going to leave this world without our stuff. Nothing wrong with having stuff. But, beloved, your value is in who you are. And so the question is, what are you going to leave? You're going to leave your stuff here when we die. What else are you going to leave here? In Luke chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 26 through 38. 26 through 38. Please listen carefully, but this is God's word. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month of her who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Last week we looked at the John the Baptist birth. And so what Luke is doing, what scripture is doing now is going to contrast between John's birth announcement and Jesus' birth and announcement. And it, it's going to be a big contrast here because why? Because Jesus obviously is greater than all. But notice what happens here. It, 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 some of the contrast, the scene that we're looking at now shifts from the temple where John, who Zacharias was, to a non-temple setting. 
from the holy city, Jerusalem, to a village of no consequences, Nazareth. You know that what's interesting about Nazareth? In all the historical writings, there's never a mention of the town Nazareth. That's how small it was. It was a small village. And Josephus, who wrote his History of the Jews, he never mentions Nazareth. A lot of the historians back then never mentioned Nazareth. So another one would be the prestige of the character of the angel shifts. Now Gabriel comes into an elderly male with high status in society. He's a priest. And Gabriel comes to a young female with no status. And you know what? Part of that principle, for me at least, is the reign of God will turn everything upside down. When you became born again, your whole life was turned upside down. Some of us more radically than others at first. But when you become born again, you become a new creation in Christ, your whole life is turned upside down. And some of us can witness to, to our family members, to people that knew us, especially maybe in a workplace. Some of our, when we submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, became born again, it was such a radical change in you that other people would recognize that. And that's what happens. That's part of the principle of being laid out here. That no matter, what, you don't think you have any status in society, the Lord turns everything upside down. He's going to Zacharias, a priest, who is in the temple offering incense, and that's what we should be doing. We should be fellowshipping with other Christians. Nothing wrong with that. Gabriel appears to him with answered prayer. And then we shift to a female, a young female. In that day and age, females didn't have too much importance attached to them. To a young female woman, and Gabriel says, highly favored one. You're going to bring the, the Messiah into this world. I think the Lord can use anybody at any time. But here's the other thing. The announcement was public in the temple to an important official, Zacharias. And it had an occasion for public rejoicing. When he was deaf mute when he came out of that temple, but the people rejoiced. And they understood that he had seen a vision. In contrast, the announcement of Jesus Christ, the Messiah who's going to come into this world, was in private. To a person of low social station in Israel, a young woman, and it, it gave Mary that time to commit herself to the Lord, to, to God. Now, Zacharias, um, you know, when we look at Mary, and there's a lot of controversy here, especially in some part of uh, sex and Christianity. But when Mary, she commits herself to what Gabriel says. She didn't say, how can this be since I'm a virgin? She says, how will this be? How will this come apart? And you know, we have a lot of, I would say, discussion or controversy over the virgin birth. We, it's, been all, it's been in the first century up till today. You, you probably know more people, especially non-believers who do not believe in the virgin birth than do. Well, how can this be? So Mary, there's two things going on here. Mary, when Gabriel appears to Mary and says, you will conceive and bear a son, and he will call him the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of the Most High. What is Mary's response? Mary isn't, well, how can this be, since I have never known a man? She, you see, they were in a bethlehem. They were in a, an engagement period of one year. Why was it one year? There's several factors why the engagement period lasted a year, but one factor was to see if the woman was pure. Because she might conceive a child during that year period, and, they, and that would break off the engagement. So having that period for one year, the father would know. But also, now, now check this out. So Gabriel comes to Mary and says, you will conceive a child. Now Mary's response could have been, well, I know I will. As soon as the engagement comes together and we get married, I have a husband waiting. That wasn't her response. Her response was, how would this be? So she understood clearly what Matthew is telling us in the Gospel of Matthew, that Isaiah 7.14 is being fulfilled right now with a virgin going to conceive a child. Mary understood what Gabriel was saying to her. 
Zacharias, on the other hand, doubted. Zacharias had, when we talked about this last week, he could take comfort in Scripture knowing that women in the past have been used by God that were older in age for a son, for a child eventually. Sarah, you have Manoah and his wife, you have Rachel. She could take comfort in that, but this is something that has never happened before. Mary, you will conceive a child even though you're a virgin. She took the Lord at his word and did not doubt that. Think of how great a faith that was. Unfortunately, and it, me, count me in on this, fortunately many times we want to ask for proofs. Are you really speaking to me, Lord? Give me a sign. Give me something to show that you are truly speaking to me. Instead, I'm reminding myself every time I start doing that, we need to follow Mary's example. She believed in God where nothing was impossible with him and humbly submitted to his will, which meant even hardship. You know, many times during Christmas season, we kind of, sometimes we set Mary up on a pedestal. Um, she wouldn't like that. She wouldn't. And because you know what? When the Lord came to Mary, and she was probably 14, 15, came to Mary and said, you're going to bear the Messiah. Don't look at it from 2,000 years back. For Mary, now think of this faith that she had to accept what the angel was telling her. Mary was young, she was poor, and she was a female. All characteristics to the people of her day that would make her seem unusable by God for such a major task. Okay? But God chose Mary for that one most important act of obedience he has ever demanded of everyone, anyone. So why is that? To think about what Mary's facing here. Mary is saying, if I believe what you're telling me, then I'm going to be branded an adulteress. Because I'm going to conceive a child before I come together with my husband. I'm going to be oster. I'm going to be mocked, slandered. I might even be stoned for adultery. You're telling me I'm going to bear a son who's going to be murdered and rejected I'm going to go through this hardship of people always talking behind my back. You know what? In John in chapter 8, uh, when the Pharisees sneered at Jesus and said, we know who our father was. Do you know who your father is? That's what they were saying. You're a bastard. We don't know who your father is. And you know, in history, it, it, you read stories that maybe he's a Roman soldier, whatever. Matthew's clearing it up here that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. His father is God the Father. But notice, in, uh, so if you feel that your ability, experience, or education makes you an unlikely choice for God's service, don't limit his power. He will use you if you trust him. Remember what when the Pharisees said, well, we know who our father is. Who's your father? What was Jesus' response to him? You're your father the devil. My father's in heaven. But that always stuck with Jesus. People still sneer at the virgin birth. Mary had to go through that her whole life. And actually, I think in this, these verses right here, because remember what uh, Luke says, he's an historian. He's searched out all the facts. But what, what more, what is uh, Luke? He's a doctor. Remember in Colossians 4.15, I believe it is, he's going to physician. He knew where babies were. He knew how babies were made. And yet Luke is saying that, the, of talking about the virgin birth. And we're going to get to the virgin birth in a minute. But look at verse 28. In verse 28, it says, And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Okay, two things here. One is, it doesn't say, the Lord be with you. Actually, now I see it in the New King James. They have is, and they have it italicized. The Lord is with you. And in the Greek, it doesn't have the verb. It doesn't have be. 
You know, in, in other words, in many places in Scripture it says, the Lord be with you. It's like a desire or a wish. It's like sometimes when I talk to people on the phone, I say, God bless. It's a desire. It's a wish. Here they're making a point in the Greek. He's saying, the Lord is with you. The Lord with you. He is with you. And what they're saying is, it, it, it's a fact. It's not a wish or a desire. Whenever the Lord calls you into some type of service, He wants you to go do something, He is with you. It's not a wish or a desire. The Lord is with you, always. But notice also, this is what I really like. He says, rejoice, highly favored one. And I got to thinking, is this where some people take Mary and say to see she's a special recipient of grace? I don't know. But it says, rejoice, highly favored one. This, that word is used one more time in Scripture. That same exact word is used twice in Scripture, one right here describing Mary, rejoice, highly favored one, but then it's used in Ephesians. In Ephesians 1, 6. But let me start at verse 5, actually. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. And this New King James has it as accepted. I think there's probably better translations. But this is what he's saying. He's saying, this is the word. So it's saying, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us highly favored in the beloved. And that word in the Greek means to favor. To make an object of favor, an object of God's gracious visitation. Just as the angel came to, Ma uh, to Mary and said, Rejoice, highly favored one. God is visiting you. He says that to each one of us. If you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you are in Jesus Christ in a personal, intimate relationship with you. You know what he says to you? Rejoice, highly favored one. You're adopted into his family. You're highly favored. He visits you constantly. He's, you're the object of his grace. You're the object of his affection. Think about that. So Mary, and we're going to see this as we go through Luke a lot of times, she'll, she'll hear something like when the angel says this to her, and then usually you say he'll, she'll ponder it in her heart. I, I think at the end of chapter 2, matter of fact, when, when uh, they find Jesus in the temple, and uh, Jesus says, I had to be about my father's business, Mary kind of steps back and ponders in her heart what this all means. And we kind of talk about it in Sunday school. But Mary would spend most of her time pondering all these events, all these things that have been given to her, that have been told to her. And I don't think she truly puts it all together to the near the end of her life. The angel does, you see, the angel sent by the Lord doesn't unveil the full picture of what the child, who the child, what the child would do and what would become of him. Okay? They would have to, that would have been too overwhelming for her. So we ask ourselves, would you really want to know what's going to happen to you tomorrow? Or a week from now? Or six months from now? Or five years from now? Probably, if you, you want to have wisdom, probably not. And so the Lord... He gives us what we need at the time. He doesn't unfold the full picture of our life in front of us. And that's why Mary's always treasuring this up in her mind. She doesn't understand the full picture. We don't understand the full picture when he uses us. But he, but we're in that personal relationship with him. And once we're in that personal relationship with him, he unfolds it through wisdom of how much we can take. And that's how we grow but notice, highly favored one. Mary's highly favored one. We are highly favored. I can't get over that word. And I thought I was clever, because I figured it out a couple days ago. I'm, well, I wonder what this word means. I wonder what else is used. Well, I just cheated, and I looked in the Sunday school thing, and I saw, oh, they got uh, Luke chapter 1, 26 through 38, so I went through it really fast. Oh, they didn't have the, that word, did they? Yeah, they do. There, that's a good workbook that we have. It's a really good Sunday school book that we go by on Sunday. And they'll talk about that when I'm talking about right now in about two weeks. So God's favor. I can't, I'm sorry, I just can't get over that. When you receive Jesus Christ as your personal savior, 
You're the object of his affection. You're the object of his favor. We're going to go through struggles with our health, with our finances, with people, division, whatever you want to call it, but beloved, you're the object of his affection. We've had a couple people pass recently, and we're going to be there one day. We will. But beloved, just think of that moment that you pass into heaven. You're going to Jesus Christ as his bride. He's the bridegroom. And do you know how much he loves you? Do you we can't, I can't even comprehend how much God loves us. But it's going to be full that day we pass from this world to the next. We're going to see Jesus Christ as he is. And we're the object of his affection right now. And he loves you. He loves everything you go through every day. Sylvia gets convicted every Sunday and going to Sunday school. We get convicted. Marsha said something that's too personal for me right now. I was convicted. But beloved, I'm telling you right now, he loves you. And he knows the struggles you go through. That's why he had to be born as a child. That's why he took on humanity to share everything that we share. He knows what you go through. But there's going to be a day when he's going to usher us into glory. For now, he has Ida here. He has Connie here. For as long as he needs us. We may be here another five years. We may be another ten years. But that day's coming when we're going to be called home. And it's all going to make sense. It's all going to make sense. So God's favor does not automatically bring success or fame. It doesn't. You know, his blessing on Mary, her honor of being the mother of Jesus, would lead to much pain. Her peers would ridicule her. Her fiancé would consider leaving her. Her son would be rejected and murdered. That's what she had to go through as she went through life. And, but she's highly favored, isn't she? But through her son would come the world's only hope. And this is why we praise Mary for all generations as a young girl who found favor with God. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if the day we die, the day Mary Jo goes to be with the Lord, her first words that she's going to hear is, Praise you, holy, favored one, for everything you did for me in this world. Just as we praise Mary today, we don't praise her, hold her up as an idol to pray to. We praise her because how the Lord used her in this life to bring the Messiah. And I have a feeling that when we die, the Lord's going to say, Well done, good and faithful servant, for everything you've done for me on this earth. Especially when we face ridicule. Especially when we face hardship in this world. Especially when we come down with that disease that we might die from. How do you handle that during that time when you're witness? And instead of leaving stuff, we're going to be leaving a good reputation for the Lord. That's what we leave, beloved. So if sorrow weighs you down or gives your hope, <laughs> think of Mary. Think of what she went through and wait patiently for God to finish working out his plan in your life. And so Luke doesn't stress Mary's virginity in order to exalt her as one who is pure and a holy vessel and worthy to give birth to a child. That's not what Luke is doing, but sometimes there's some branches of Christians that do that. Her virginity is presented as an obstacle to conception that can only be overcome by the miraculous creative power of God. You see, when Mary, when the when the angel appeared to Mary, it's not because she was acceptable to bear the child. God made her acceptable. God used the, uh, the well, we had to go come through a virgin, but at the same time, it's not because Mary was his holy great saint that never sinned and never will sin it's to show the power of God that he can do something impossible that 
nothing's impossible with God. And every time he answers one of our prayers, or you have that hard circumstance in front of you, nothing is impossible with God. If he can bring the Messiah through a 14-year-old girl, he can do whatever you ask him to do, as long as it's according to his will. And beloved, let me tell you, you pray most of the time according to his will. You don't think you do, but you do. So why is a virgin birth so important to Christian faith? Jesus had to be free from the sinful nature passed on to all humans by Adam. You know, that's why that one verse I mentioned in Sunday school, I saw this years ago and it's always stuck with me. Unto us a child is born. whose humanity, Jesus became human. Unto us a son is given. Not born, but the son of God is always eternal. There it is, right there. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. There's the humanity and the deity of Jesus Christ right there in that verse. Jesus Christ had to be completely human, and he was completely divine. And those natures never mixed. And I know it sounds odd at times when I say the God-man, but that's what he is. 100% God, 100% man, those natures never mixed. Jesus is both fully human and fully divine. Because he lived as a man, we know he fully understands our struggles with sin. He does. Sometimes I'm guilty of this. I rush over those verses, like Hebrews 4, 15, 16, and don't really feel the impact of that. But when I worry or when I struggle with something, he knows. He's there as my high priest. He knows exactly what I'm going through. Because he is God, he has the power and the authority to l deliver people from sin. You know, I, when Jesus forgave sin when he walked the earth, that was big controversy there. How can he forgive sins? Jesus saying, because I'm God, I can forgive sins. But that's why. In um, Philippians, you don't have to turn there, but Philippians chapter 1. And I believe it is, you know, chapter 2 in verse, I'm going to start at verse 10. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every time should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The name that's to be uh, above all names is not Jesus not in this context. See, when we hear the name Jesus, we should fall on our knees and worship and, and give him praise. But that's not the name that's going to be glorified above all names. Because now listen to these verses again. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those under the earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the name above every name, Adonai. And you know, and uh, I think Ida and, and Sylvia mentioned in Sunday school, it's capitalized. When, you, when they would take Yahweh out of the Old Testament and put it in the New Testament, they would translate it Adonai in many places. And that's usually Lord, capitalized, Lord. Because Adonai means Lord. But that word is, He is Yahweh. He is God. And so, the name of Jesus Christ is magnified and glorified because of who he is, God manifest in the flesh. He was in glory, exalted in glory. He laid aside his glory. He came down. He, he lived in humiliation as a human being. And then when he rose from the dead, he went back to exaltation. That's who Jesus Christ is. And as I, uh, I, I'm reading through... Um, at home, church history, I don't know, up to about the fourth century. And I noticed one thing that might be applicable right now is that the first three centuries, Christians uh, were being persecuted from time to time from certain Caesars, certain emperors. They would be persecuted, not all the time, but at certain periods of time during those first three centuries. 
So they didn't have time to sit down and, and, and talk about doctrinal differences and doctrinal what we should believe, exactly how we should believe, et cetera, et cetera. They're on the run. They're on the, on the, on the verge of building this church body. And then Constantine comes into the picture. And Constantine, uh, whether he's a believer or not, who knows? Uh, we don't know. We'll know when we get to heaven, I suppose. But Constantine wins his big victory, and, and he uh, legalizes Christianity. It's what we have today. Christians were able to go out to the marketplace and talk freely about their faith without being persecuted. Because many times during the first three centuries, they would have you come in front of Caesar and say, Jesus is Lord. If you say Jesus is Lord, you're going to be tortured and eventually martyred. But if you gave your Bible back to him or denied that Jesus Christ is Adonai, that Jesus Christ is God, you would be tortured and martyred. So the first, so Constantine comes to power and he legalizes. So you, you're able, he opens the jail gates and all the Christians that have been tortured, scars remaining on them, will come out and start talking about Christ. So you would go down, just like America today, you go down to the marketplace and you start talking about, well, I think Jesus is God, or, or I, I think he's the first created being, or I think this, this, or this. You were free to do that, just that we are in America. Then you had the Dantist controversy. <laughs> what the Dantist controversy was, was this uh, bishop that said, now wait a minute, all these Christians are coming out of jail, they have scars on them, and then we know the other Christians that deny Christ, to avoid being martyred and tortured, what do we do with them? That was a controversy back. They didn't say that, that they didn't divide the church, but Don just said, if you deny Christ, you're not allowed into the church. And Augustine's the one that actually championed it and said he finally won the, the day. And he said, no, it has nothing to do with it. God knows the invisible church. We don't know the invisible church on earth, 2 Timothy 2.19. God does, so don't judge anybody because Peter denied Christ, right? They, you know, if they repent, they're allowed back into the church. That didn't divide the church. What divided the church was the Nicene Creed, which came out like 20 years later. Well, Constantine ordered almost 400 bishops to come together and finally put it on paper the, the nature of God. What is the nature of God? And Arius who was a charismatic, good speaker, public speaker, <clears throat> said, no, Christ is the first created being. And he took, I don't know, 15 or 20 bishops with him, and they finally came to the conclusion that no, Christ is God. That's what the Nicene Creed is, the Trinity. And now this is where it happened. This is where the division happened. If you did not confess that Christ was God, you are not allowed in the church. All the other controversies, you're allowed in the church. But this one certain, if you didn't believe that Christ was God, you're not allowed in the church. That's what divided the church. And beloved, so at, every, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Christ is a dying, that Christ is God. That's who we're celebrating this Christmas season. And one more thing before we finish up. Now, when I go through this really fast, remember, Zacharias was more right than what I'm getting at here. Look at the contrast between Zacharias and Mary. Devout prayer occasions the appearance to Zachariah. What was Zacharias doing? He was in uh, doing fervent prayer for his son and for the nation, and Gabriel appears to him in the temple saying, Rejoice, your prayer has been heard. Mary, the visit to Mary comes completely at the divine initiative and not as a result of her fervent prayer. In other words, Mary wasn't praying to, to be the mother of the Messiah. The Lord just came to her and said, This is what's going to happen. Zacharias addressed by name when the angel first greets him. Mary is not addressed by name when the angel greets her but only in terms of how God has bestowed grace on her. Highly favored ones. In other words, God's grace is highlighted. Zacharias in Jerusalem serving as priest in the temple one might expect to encounter God. That's why I'm saying Zacharias is right. We should be coming to church on Sunday expecting to hear from God. 
We should be during our prayers during each day expecting to hear from God. But Mary is a young woman in a village of no reputation, but responds in faith to God's good news. In other words, what's being said here is that be careful not to fall into rituals that can easily lead to manipulation. Always be open to the Lord and in surprising ways he might speak to you and tell you what he wants you to do. Our goal should be to to be in church, to be in prayer, to, to set aside every day some time with the Lord, expecting Him to answer. But, beloved, when you're in that deep, intimate, personal relationship with God, everything's going well, expect Him. He might just come to you out of the blue and tell you to do something you've never even thought of. And that's the God we worship. 